Mm, yep. All right. And like I said, we have a great presenter today. Uh, his name is Eric. And he will go ahead and introduce himself a little bit further. But the floor is yours, Eric. Thank you so much, Morgan. Uh, we yeah. really, really want to say thanks to everyone who, who showed up and, and for your interest in this. Um, as Morgan said, I'm Eric Slagay. I'm the chief actuary at Ally Insurance. I have a little over 23 years uh, of industry experience. Um, and as you can imagine, in that time, I've, I've done a number of presentations, um, some, some good, some, some not so good. So uh, I have some lessons here that I've learned over, over my career and, and really want to, before we even start, uh, throw a big shout out to Bill Mulvihill, who is a manager in our learning and development team, who uh, played a major role in pulling this presentation together, wanted to make sure that he got a, a lot of the credit for that. And I don't know if you've read some of the actuarial papers or some of the monographs or something like that, where the author says, and then all mistakes are my own. Uh, anything that isn't right is, is clearly on me. It certainly wasn't from Bill. Um, so want to talk a little bit about presentation skills and how we can build and deliver uh, impactful presentations. So as we go through this, um, keep in mind a couple of things. One, these are all guidelines. Um, they are not hard and fast if you don't do them. It's not that your presentation won't be good or impactful. We're just trying to provide some guidelines that you can work through. If you pay close enough attention, you'll notice that I break some of these rules in the slides that I put out there, that I will probably break some of these guidelines as we're working through the presentation. But that, but that's uh, nothing to be overly concerned about. Can you move to the next slide, please, Morgan? Thanks. So learning objectives, right? we, we want uh, you to be able to take away from this presentation. I think first and foremost, expectations and a growth plan. How to design an effective presentation, how to deliver an effective presentation, and then how to manage a, a Q&A session. So hopefully as we go through this, we have some questions at the end. Um, I want to provide some context in there. So I will answer some of them using some of the uh, guidelines we give for how to manage a Q&A session. And I'll, I'll do some in a very different way. And hopefully we can compare and contrast the, the effectiveness of working through those. Next slide. Biggest thing you can take away from this entire presentation is at the top of the slide in that purple banner. Your presentation is not about you. It's about your audience, right? You may be nervous, you may be scared, your audience isn't, right? You have a lot of things you wanna get, but what we really wanna make sure we do is convey our information to our audience because that's the people we're there for. Right? You already know all the information. You're trying to help your audience get it and, and pick it up. Um, bold, italicized, underlined, top line, you won't be great at presenting the first number of times that you do it. It's totally okay. Um, sometimes we put way too much pressure on ourselves to be great, uh, especially the first time we do things. Presentation skills are built exp experientially. Try and get a lot of reps. This points to the growth. Uh, actively seek opportunities and feedback to constantly get better. You know, if, you, if you're never doing it, you're not gonna get better at it. You want very candid feedback. Um, you know, a lot of times, you have to ask for that and to make sure that you have some trusted people there that will provide that for you. Every presenter has their own style, find yours. Every company has their own style of decks and presentations, learn yours. Uh, this deck has a very uh, obvious color scheme. I did not come up with that color scheme, right? So making sure that you're, you're taking advantage of that and that you're providing things in a way that people are gonna be familiar with seeing. Every audience has different needs and expectations, different styles that are gonna work for them. Know your audience. A lot of times we learn our audience through trial and error, but try to leverage other people in your organization who have presented to your audience so that you can try to shorten that learning. It's okay to be nervous, right? <laughs> your growth plan is how you get over that. That said, you really shouldn't be nervous. You're the most knowledgeable person in that room. 
talking about that particular topic. It's the reason you're the one doing the presenting. The only time that might not be true is if, say, your boss, or your manager, or your leader wants to provide you an opportunity to present and, and to get in front of people and, and to build and develop those skills. If that's the case, trust me. They want you to succeed probably even more than you do. So they're there to help and support you. Be appropriately authentic. Different situations call for different tones of messaging. You know, one size doesn't fit all. So know your time. Here in a presentation like this, I'm going to be enthusiastic. I'm going to be energetic. Probably be a little bit loud sometimes. I got a big set of ones. <laughs> I apologize if it's too much. Um, but you know that's the right way to deliver a message like this. If I was delivering the message that we're going to lose a hundred billion dollars, I would not be energetic and excited about something like that. You need to make sure that you're appropriate. Um, you know the bottom line there: practice, practice, practice. Um, dry runs, engaging non-experts for reviews, specifically when it comes to being an actuary. Uh, we do a lot of sophisticated stuff. We have to make sure that we communicate it in a way that perhaps non-technical people can absorb that information. So having a review with someone who's not an expert can really give you some great feedback about if your deck is appropriate, if your messaging is appropriate. Um, uh, there's a, a woman who I work with who does this for my team and we've found that it's incredibly beneficial. I've done dry runs with other members of my team where we'll walk through what they're gonna be presenting ahead of time and got a lot of great feedback that they feel more confident, they get a chance to get some tips and some pointers and it's been very beneficial. So, so look to do things like that as, as you move uh, on in your presentation and in, in your careers. Next slide, please, Morgan. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about effective presentations and them being based on effective visuals, preparation, communication skills. So if you look to the left side of the screen, you'll see uh, some high level presentation checklist, opening and introductions, agenda and objectives, understanding your audience, recommendations and presentation takeaways, evidence sources, tools and resources and essence. We'll dive into these all in more depth you know, later in, in the presentation. If you look over on the right side, visuals and communication skills. Three main visual aids, bullets and words, pictures and images, graphs and charts. Uh, you know, the bottom bullet there, how you present is as important as what you present. If we're presenting effectively, people are gonna retain that information, people are going to engage, People are gonna be much more active, much more likely to take away the message we want to deliver. So what we're saying and how we're saying it are just as important. Next slide, please, Mark. Deep diving on the presentation checklist, know the basics. A lot of these will seem very intuitive and very high level. You can never, you can never be, have the basics down too well. So first is your delivery method. Is it in person? Is it virtual or both? Different things need to be taken into consideration depending on how that presentation is gonna be. Understanding your audience. Who's in the audience? How many people? What should they get from the presentation? Topic, theme of the presentation. Purpose of the presentation. What's your message? How much time do you have for the presentation? You don't want a 15 minute presentation for a five minute time slot. <laughs> that, that doesn't end well. Uh, and what information or tools do you need, resources and support? So talking a little bit more about the audience, knowing who's in it, knowing how many people you're speaking to, and what they should be getting from the presentation. When you present, what message do you want them to leave with? If we're thinking about that when we're building our presentation, when we're building the deck, we're building our talking points. It's going to really be foundational to what our understanding is. Ordering of slides, those type of things. The purpose of the presentation. What do you want someone to get out of it? Are you asking them for an action? Are you asking them for a decision? If you are, we need to make that very clear. We need to be very upfront about that. You never want to bury the lead. What information do you need? Resources. 
uh, in this new day and age, where we're doing a lot of presenting via Zoom and those sorts of things. I'm sure everyone's been on one where someone couldn't get their deck to, to, to come up. They couldn't share their screen. Or you know, how many times have people heard, uh, excuse me, I think you're on mute, right? Understand what you are using and the tools, especially if you're presenting in an environment. Uh, I ran into this yesterday where I was trying to display in a conference room I had never displayed in before on some new tools that we have here. And it took me about five minutes to figure it out. Glad I was just walking through this presentation um, ahead of time so, so that it wasn't that impactful. But, you know, for example, Morgan and I got on 15 minutes before the presentation so that we could walk through all these things and know who was doing what and make sure that we were, we were ready for something like this. Next slide, please. Presenta the presentation text is a highly effective way to plan for your presentation, right? What's your opening and introduction? What are your agen agenda and objectives? And what are the differences between those? What are your recommendations and presentation takeaways? What are your evidence and sources? I'll touch a little bit more on this in a second. Tools and resources. Again, know, know what you need, know how to operate what you have. And, and then SMEs. Make sure that if you're relying on SMEs or providing evidence from an SME, that you establish who that individual is during the introductions so that people understand why we're listening to that person. Um, another key thing here, don't use acronyms that you don't define and that everybody might not know. Um, <laughs> SME is a subject matter expert. See, I, I told you even I'm not that great at this. Um, when we're talking about your opening and your introductions, you want energy and you want that introduction. You want people to be in your presentation really engaged and really doing that. And a lot of that is your tone and where you carry yourself as well as what you're saying. You also want to produce that introduction. Why are you the person here presenting today? The agenda and objectives are very different. So the, the agenda sets the path for the presentation, gives people a heads up on what they should expect. The objective is what are you trying to take away from that presentation, right? What am I trying to convey to my audience? Uh, an agenda also very helpful in keeping people on track, keeping the conversation moving forward. Recommendation presentation takeaways. This is this is the key. Right? This is the reason you're presenting. Don't bury the headline. Right? Don't make somebody try to figure out what's going on. Don't make people search for your recommendation. Make sure that it's clear and obvious, stated early. You want the facts and the support that you provide to reinforce your conclusion, not to necessarily come before your conclusion. One of the worst things you can do is provide a bunch of data, a bunch of information, because people are gonna naturally want to come up with their own conclusion. <laughs> you don't necessarily want that to happen, right? You want to provide your recommendation or conclusion, provide your supporting facts and your evidence to support your conclusion, that people can ask questions about that. They can engage and say, well, why did you assume this? What about this? Have you thought of that? Works a lot better than if they're busy while you're presenting, trying to build their own conclusion. Uh, evidence and sources, again, appropriate to your audience. Some people are swayed by expert opinions. Some people are statistics. Some like to hear test cases. Make sure that you're tailoring your presentation to your audience. And that may mean that you have two or three presentations, depending on which particular audience you're presenting to. Um, when, when we go through rate recommendations or reserve recommendations on my team, what people present to me before we go to the rest of the senior leadership team looks very different than what ends up in front of our CFO or our CEO and whatnot. So making sure that the detail and, and the way we're messaging is appropriate to, to the audience. Good. Next slide, please. Mark. Designing an effective presentation. Uh, up here, bullets and words should be used judiciously. I think everyone's probably seen a slide that looked a lot more like a page in a newspaper than a slide with bullets. Uh, a lot of times people would call that density in a slide. Your slides can't be too dense because if they're too dense, you're really not going to connect with your audience because naturally what we want to do is we want to read this. We want to get to the slide, then we want to read. 
So making sure that we're being effective and judicious in our use of words and bullets. Some best practices for that is around font, clean and easy to read. Uh, the six by six by six rule. No more than six bullets per page. Attempt to have six words per bullet. You should be able to read the slide from six feet away from your computer. Upper and lower case lettering. We should generally follow set standard sentence structure. You'll notice in the preceding bullet, they didn't. Intentionally for emphasis on the upper and lower case lettering. Never end a bullet with punctuation marks. Don't know why. I can't tell you why. You just really should never do that. Uh, use styling to emphasize. I think you probably saw that a little bit on the first page. Bold, underlined, italicized, really trying to drive the point home. Examples here, won't walk through all of them, but bullets should be short and concise. You get to the point. You can expand on it when you're discussing bullets. If you have a bullet that looks like this, you may be using too many words, and you should probably rethink using a bullet like this since there are too many words. Um, this is, a, this is something that trips a lot of people up, especially the first time they're presenting. They want to try and convey all the information they know. They want to put all the details in there. And that's when you can really get some slides that are a little too dense. Never end a bullet with a punctuation mark. Never end a bullet with a punctuation mark. And then, you know, just to prove we're all fallible, words are not as powerful as you think with an exclamation. Um, we need to think about how we're presenting for maximum impact. Are we using charts? Are we using graphs? Are we using our other presentation skills, body language, tone, inflection, those sorts of things? Next slide, please. Pictures and images should be used to clarify a concept or an idea. Some best practices with pictures and images one picture image per slide. Anything more than that gets really busy. One concept per visual. People are going to connect with that picture. They're going to connect with that visual. We want them to connect with one thing. We're trying to get them to understand three things with that picture. Probably trying to do too much. We should probably break that up across multiple slides. Use the image to convey the concept or idea. Here, the picture's worth a thousand words. Um, Quick little example off on the right. For example, tornado claims a lot of times are caused by tornadoes throwing things into cars. I got the question one time, hey, Eric, I think you're over reserving for that particular claim. Then I sent that picture <laughs> and said, I could be, but I'm pretty comfortable with that because this is the actual damage. It's not necessarily what you're thinking of from typical tornado damage. So being able to use that one image really conveyed the message better than any explanations that I could possibly have used. Next slide, please, Morgan. Chart and graph best practices, right? The charter graph supports your conclusion, so state the conclusion first. You're presenting information, not data. Never force the audience to draw their own conclusion. One chart or graph per slide, again, more than this gets a little busy. We want to include title, access labels, and a legend. Otherwise, the message can get confused. People are like, oh, which one's the top one again? What's going on? Some recommendations for use, probably everyone on this page probably knows this, pie charts for percentage of the whole, line charts for trends over time, bar charts for comparisons. For example, here you can see that this is a graph of inflation trends and vehicle maintenance and repair, where we're showing the index value on the vertical axis, we're showing time periods across the horizontal axis, we're showing an article parts inflation in purple, we're showing consumer price index in green. Next slide, please. Delivering an effective presentation is also part how we're doing the presenting, right? Um, Nonverbal cues, body language, background, positioning, and framing, tone, 
again, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, appropriate for the subject, proper volume, proper use of inflection, and proper articulation. Energize your message, right? Have a balanced stance or position. You know, if I was over here, you'd probably be wondering what was going on and, and why I'm doing that. My camera doesn't even get it. That's why it went blurred, right? Um, describe and emphasize and increase your volume and use inflection when you need to. If you look at the graph over on, on the right-hand side, this was a study done by UCLA. 38% how you sound, 55% how you look, 7% what you're saying. So a lot of different uh, you know, impacts in being effective when we're presenting. Move to the next slide, please, Morgan. Nonverbal cues can really purvey and convey a lot of information. And so we need to pay attention to them. A lot of times, some of the things that we're doing nonverbally, we don't know that we're doing, right? Stance and posture. Be intentional about how you're standing, how you're positioning yourself. We want this to be welcoming. I was like hunched over and, you know, trying to be like some great big ogre in the camera. My message would not be as effective, right? I want to be welcoming when I'm discussing things, when my your hands are open, they're not closed. You don't want to do any of the things that you couldn't see off to the side thing. You know, if you're presenting in person and you're on stage, you don't want to put your hands in your pockets, right? Some people do this. They have no idea that they're doing it, right? The twitch sort of, you know, we don't want to be herky-jerky, especially nowadays when we're on camera because things get caught and you have this little box that you're trying to convey all your message through. Also, who hasn't been caught on Zoom when you're, you know, you're, internet gets broken or something like that, and then you get some really weird thing froze up there. Like we wanna be very careful about that, right? Velcro, you, know, you also don't wanna stand and not move at all because then you're just looking really awkward, right? And it's almost uncomfortable for the audience because they can feel that you're a little bit uncomfortable because that's why you're not moving at all. Uh, the dance, you know, moving, shifting, all those sorts of things uh, can be a distraction tilt, right? If you have sort of an awkward stance, you're off to one side, that's conveying information. And you want to make sure that we're intentionally doing those things. Um, body and hand movements, again, intention. You should add to the presentation, not distract from it. Um, if I was kind of doing this the entire time I was talking, you would not be paying attention to what I'm saying. You'd be like, why is he waving at us, right? So those types of things happen. And you know, I, I work with an individual who snaps their fingers when they're trying to make a point. And sometimes that can be distracting. Positioning and framing, sort of talked about that earlier. If I was off to the side, you would have a real questions about why I was doing that, what it was, and it would be a distraction from my message. I'm gonna be centered when you're on camera. And if you're presenting in front of a group, perhaps on stage, you want to make sure that you're moving fluidly and in a balanced way. Your background, again, intentional. Make sure that it adds to the presentation. It doesn't distract from it. I'm sure everyone has seen the person zooming from their bedroom when their bed's not made, right? Those sorts of things distract. Right? We want to make sure that we have a very professional background, you know, books, plants, artwork, you know degrees or certifications, but, you know, something that's on your wall and that isn't distracting, that's really adding to your presentation. Next slide, please. Tone, the way we're saying things and how we're saying things really engages our audience and essentially lets them know what's coming, right? Talked about this a little bit before, appropriate for the topic. You need to match the mood of the topic. One size does not fit all. Volume can't be low. It's a major distraction. We use volume for emphasis, right? Don't yell. If you're in a room and you need a microphone or some sort of other device, make sure that you get it, that you're using it appropriately. Inflection. Don't be monotone. 
I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm the one. I remember Eeyore, right? If you talk like this, doesn't matter what you're saying, everybody's going to tune you out. Part of the challenge is once they tune you out, it's really hard to get them back. It's better not to lose them in the first place. Articulation. Pronounce clearly, don't mumble. Keep your hands and objects away from your mouth in case you like a pen chewer or, or something like that. You want to make sure that you're not doing anything like that. And don't use words your audience doesn't know. And this goes, you know, twofold for acronyms that your audience may not know. And that can be a challenge, especially when you're in a work environment or you saw me do it today. I don't think there's anyone I work with who doesn't know what an SME is, but there are probably a few people on this call who didn't know what an SME was. So make sure to be very conscious of that. Next slide, please. Delivery skills, so clearing bullet points, right? Key presentation skills. Best practices for clearing bullet points, read the same way that your audience would read. It's gonna help drive a connection with your audience and it's easiest for them to follow. Feel free to add in transitional phrases to make things conversational, right? Your audience isn't going to be engaged if it seems like you're just reading something to them. They're gonna ask, why didn't I just get this email to me? I, I can read this just as well as I can have someone read it to me. Okay. Don't expound on a bullet until you've cleared all the bullets. It can be distracting. It can make retaining information more complex for topics that are introduced earlier in the slide because you're expounding on it and you're working your way through the slide. Someone can forget what's going on at the bottom of that slide. You can highlight items visually using your arm or a pointer or other technological tools appropriate. Never touch the screen. And don't interfere with the visual. If you're presenting, make sure you're not in front of a light source or something like that. Next slide, please. I think anyone who's been listening to this presentation knows that sometimes I struggle with that particular advice myself. So again, if you do, don't, don't worry about it. You work through these things over time. Best practices around clearing charts and graphs. Going back to it, provide the conclusion of the chart and graph first, right? We don't want people making their own conclusions. We want them either agreeing or disagreeing with the conclusion we've drawn or providing that graph as support, right? We're not here providing information, information, sorry, not data, right? We, we, we turn data into, into information, as actuaries. We don't turn data into more data. One of the best ways to, to clear a graph is using the G technique and I'll demonstrate that after we work through this and start the title, vertical axis, horizontal axis, legend, middle of the chart. Take your time, right? It's especially if this is something people haven't seen before, they need the time to digest the information. They need the time to process and go, okay, if Eric's main point is X, and he's showing me this graph saying that this graph supports his main point. I need to look at it, see it, and either agree or disagree. You want the audience to be comfortable with what you present. You don't want them to be confused. So for example, clearing this chart, I'd say this is a chart detailing inflation trends for vehicle maintenance and repair, index value on the left side, months going from January to 19 to November 20. One across the bottom, purple line is auto parts inflation, you know, green line is consumer price index or CPI. Next slide, please. Managing a QA session. QA session is in every presentation, right? It's our last chance to make a good impression. It's also one of our best places to clarify and make sure that our audience is leaving with the impression, the recommendation, the information that we want them to leave our presentation. Best practices, acknowledge the question. Listen for the issue. Listen to understand, not to answer. Use a clarifying question if we need to. Use a relationship building phrase, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on what those are in a second. 
break visually. Repeat the question for the audience, so in the, in the venture in a, in a room, and everyone may not be able to hear, just so everyone knows the context of your answer. This, I think, is the most important part. Answer the question if you can. Never be afraid to say you'll look into things and follow up with someone. I think this is one of the greatest fears people have when they're presenting, that someone's going to ask them something that they don't know the answer to. That's really okay. You're going to be a lot better off saying, you know, thank you for the question. We're going to dive into it. We'll get back with you. Then you will be trying to fumble something out, make something up on stand, right? This is one of those areas, and especially for actuaries, people who are, you know, answer people. Right, like this is one of the things I think makes people really nervous. So if you can embrace the fact that it's totally okay to say, we'll look into it, we'll follow up. It's really gonna help you with some of those nerves around presenting. Going back in a little bit more detail, listening for the issue, listen to understand, not to answer. A lot of times when people are prepping for a presentation, they go through, okay, these are all the questions the audience might possibly be able to answer or ask. And I have an answer for every one of them. And so someone can ask a question and it seems kind of close. And if you're listening to answer, you're going to give them the answer to the question they may not have asked because that's one of the answers you're ready to get, right? So really listen to understand, really engage with that individual to find out not just what they're asking, but why they're asking, so that you can provide the question, the answer to the question that they're really looking for, really providing that depth, really making sure that you're making that connection. A relationship building phrase is something other than great question, right? Um, I'm sure people have been on, you know, calls or in sessions where everyone said great question when they asked it, you know, a lot of times a relationship building phrase can be something like, I get that a lot in these kind of questions to try to engage, or you're making a really great point. I hadn't thought about that. Can you, can you give me a little bit more, right? So that's part of that you know, clarifying question, but also that phrase where you're trying to dig and make sure that you're answering the right question. But also you don't want people to, you know, if you, if you forget to do that and someone goes, oh, well, everyone else had a great question and Eric just went off and answered mine. Did I ask a bad question? You know, does, does he think something around me? So using those kind of phrases. So one, you're not redundant and just saying the same thing because then that loses impact, right? If, if we have 10 questions at the end of this presentation and I say great question to everyone, by the time I get to number nine, somebody may go, yeah, that's just what Eric says, right? wanting to make sure that we're engaging with our audience and keeping them in part. I appreciate the time. And now that we've gone through how to manage a Q&A, probably a great time to, to go into the Q&A. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes, so if you want to Unmute yourself and ask the question. You can raise your hand, or if you just want to drop drop it in the chat, um, that would be good too. I know I have a, a question, but oh, keep the name. I can see your. It just popped up. Can you go ahead and um, ask? Can you hear me, at least? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I want to put you this was an amazing presentation. I enjoyed every minute of it. But I also wanted to add, how would you recommend or how do you do with notes probably before a presentation, naturally during a presentation? How would you navigate it? And what would you advise you to do with this throughout a presentation? I'm, I'm sorry, you were breaking up a little bit on my end. Can can you repeat the question? Or Morgan, if you heard it, can you, can you repeat the Here, question? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Um, I okay. believe you were asking about notes, but I just want you to go ahead and- oh, No, not notes, about notes. How do you do with notes before a presentation and probably during a presentation? How would you oh, not really? make mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, Keith, and sorry about my, my challenge on my end here. Okay. 
you just do it a lot. I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, the first time you give a presentation, you're going to be incredibly nervous. The second time, you're probably going to be slightly less nervous. Um, the third time you do it, you're probably going to be just a little less nervous. You know, it truly is something that comes with reps. Um, you know, there are a lot of different techniques out there. You know, one of the things that I like to do, and, and I sort of told the, the audience uh, about this when I first started, I did this presentation yesterday with the person who helped me build this presentation so that I could get feedback, so that I could run through this, so that the first time I was presenting it to, to you all wasn't the first time that I had presented the presentation, right? I find that a lot of times that's the best way to get over it. Because I think a lot of times the problem and, and where those nerves come from is like, okay, even if it's, you know, you've done as many presentations as I have, if you're presenting something for the first time, because it's new material or it's a new recommendation or those sorts of things, it can be nerve wracking because you haven't done it before. So I would really tell you, do a dry run out there. You know, make sure that you're speaking about it and you've worked through it and you go, okay, well, I got tripped up a little bit here. So I know when I do it tomorrow that I'll have focus on that and I'll be able there. Um, the other thing I would really do is really just take that deep breath, compose yourself and try to build that self-confidence up, right? The reason you are presenting is because you are the unequivocal expert on what you are presenting, right? You truly are the smartest person in the room about the topic that you're presenting. And you, you just have to really embrace that, right? Feel free to embrace those nerves, right? You know, that's, that's your brain trying to keep you, you know, safe, right? So, you know, working through that, like that nerve is just a natural part of your body and it's what it's going to be. Um, a lot of times, if you can try and channel that nervousness into excitement, or into energy, right? That's going to come out, and someone might go, "Man, you know, Eric's really excited to talk about presentation skills." Well, maybe I'm just really nervous, so that's why I'm a little bit more animated, and that's why I'm a little bit louder. But it doesn't come off bad; it comes off as as this positive energy, and people are like, "Well, I don't know what he's even going to be talking about, but I, I know I want to hear it because he's 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 conveying that." Um, if that doesn't work, you know, put your pants on two legs at once, right? Because then everyone else puts them on one leg at a time. You're, you know, you're better than people because you know you did that by putting your pants on both legs at once. You know, any little trick like that just to make you feel more confident. About it. Um, but truly, it, it really is. It really is about reps, about reps, and doing it over and over. Um, so even if the first one doesn't go well, you got to do the next one because I promise you the next one would be better than the first one. And then every next one is gonna be better than the last one. So, you know, embrace it, see what you can do about it, build that self-confidence and, you know, those, those tips will work. And like I said, sort of on the first slide, everyone has their own style and you need to really embrace that. You know, your style could be very different from mine. Um, doesn't mean it's better, doesn't mean it's worse, it's yours. And you're going to feel a lot more comfortable being yourself and having your own style than you are trying to fit into somebody else's. That was such an amazing answer. I, I think that was spot on. Um, just practice, believe in yourself, put that energy into your presentation, doing all of those things, those are very important. And yeah, just knowing that you are the smartest person in the room, I think that's the biggest takeaway that I took from that and something that I carried with myself. Um, I'm presenting this information because people want to know what I think about the information. So I am the smartest person in the room and they're coming to me <laughs> to learn more about it. So definitely just build on that self-confidence because it will get you very far. And once you start presenting, there's no stopping, you can only get better. So yeah, I think those are perfect points, Eric. Um, yeah, and we have a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, Ruby asked, 
how do you rightly answer the question of know your audience for social platforms like Twitter, YouTube presentations, et cetera? Hmm. Ruby, that is a fantastic question. <laughs> and I will give you a, probably a pretty bad answer. Um, I'm not on social platforms. The only one I'm on is LinkedIn. Um, but I, I think the answer I, I would give you for that is know who you're trying to communicate with, right? Um, I, I made maybe my third or fourth post ever on social media today. Um, re, it's not retweeting, um, reposting something one of my managers posted because we're looking to, to hire a, a new associate analyst. Um, you know, who am I trying to communicate with on that? I'm trying to communicate with every graduating, um, you know, senior Asheville science student uh, or anybody out there in my network or, or tangentially connected to my network to try and get the fact that we're hiring out in front of those people. So, you know, if you're trying to communicate with people to, you know, for, for whatever reason you're trying to communicate with, know who you're trying to communicate to when you're posting something on a, a social media platform like that. Because, you know, especially if you're uh, a public profile um, and, and anyone who comes across it can see it, really know who you are messaging to who you're trying to speak to because when your audience could be the entire world you really want to make sure that when you're communicating when you're presenting that you're building that message for the people that you're trying to speak to and i apologize probably wasn't the greatest answer but i don't have a lot of uh, experience in that one um, if you if you want, I can talk to our social media team here. Maybe, maybe get some more, uh, more seasoned veterans answering that question for me. No, I I think that you answered it very well. Um, just if you're trying to figure out who your audience is, who are you trying to reach? That's the first question. Um, and who do you think that your services or whatever you're trying to offer? What? How does that benefit? those people that you're trying to reach. You know, so of course, IABA, we're trying to reach black actuaries. It ranges from, you know, all over, um, but really Instagram and Twitter, young people are on Instagram and Twitter, you know, and older people are on Facebook and LinkedIn. So I direct my messaging when we're posting and promoting events. I direct my messaging based on that and who's more likely to see these posts than others. So knowing your audience and just kind of looking at that older people like, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook. I love everything, but you know, I'm kind of that 1%. <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely, even YouTube, um, they say like millennials are more likely to get on YouTube um, than any other generation. I don't know why, but yeah. So I definitely just think, you know, do the research um, and figure out what are you trying to offer your target audience? So, yeah. Um, and then we have one more question in, in the chat uh, from Nancy. She said, thank you for the tips. What do you think about icebreakers in a professional setting presentation to make me connect better with the audience and relax the audience? Uh, is it appropriate? That's a good question. This, this, is, a, this is a challenging question because I, I don't think there's a, a right answer to it. I think this comes back to knowing your audience. And I think it comes back to appropriate tone and those types of things. If you're speaking to a few people, you know them well, you know that a joke will just loosen the room up and make it easier, easier to converse. It might be. Um, if it could fall flat, you, you might think sort of twice about it. I, I, Think it truly too depends on what an icebreaker is. If it's coming in and having a conversation or coming in and providing some background on yourself or who you are, depending on that type of icebreaker, you know, maybe more broadly applicable. But I think this is one of those um, things where you want to do that 
sort of self-examination. You, you want to look and you want to go, if I put this in there and I say it, how would I feel if I hurt? Um, you know, if we have to think, is it funny? It probably isn't. Um, you know, if you're questioning if it's an appropriate to use or not, if you ever have that question, it probably isn't. Or you're better off erring on the side of caution than you are executing it. I think, you know, when we think about these types of things, I always think about bang for the buck. Like, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? If it's, you know, if it gets us a little bit, but it's a little bit more risky, I probably wouldn't. So I think it really depends on what kind of icebreaker it is. You know, if it's giving a little bit of background or something like that, probably very appropriate if it's appropriate for the presentation and the time. But I think that's one you really always have to think long and hard about. Um, also think about why you would be using it. Is the icebreaker to make you more comfortable presenting? If it is, I think we go back to, you know, the key about the presentation is your audience, right? And so if you're gonna do something that's kind of just for you, you might wanna leave that up. You might wanna you know, look at it from the audience perspective and, and what would they wanna hear and what would really help engage them. Um, so my recommendation would be, it depends, but I would always err on the side of caution and say, probably better off not using those unless it's a room that you're really, really comfortable with. But my recommendation would be probably not. Yeah, I, and she said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that input. Yes. Um, I've recently graduated college last year, so it hasn't been that long. Um, but I know college, they love icebreakers. <laughs> love, love, love icebreakers. So um, I think it just comes down to like formal, informal settings or professional and personal settings because we love doing that and like, you know, our organizations that we're affiliated with. But I personally wouldn't want to have an icebreaker at like the president's meeting and he's telling us everything about the university, what's coming up. He's talking about budget cuts and things like that. I don't want to do an icebreaker. So yeah, I, I agree with you, Eric. It, I think you should leave it up to you know your own discretion. And if you kind of have to ask, it's probably not. <laughs> Usually it's kind of like, oh, that would be fun to do an icebreaker here. Um, but if you kind of have to ask, then I don't think so either. So. But I love a good icebreaker, I do. I might start implementing these um, in our boot camps for next year. If you you think that would be a good idea, Eric, to start implementing icebreakers in our boot camps sessions. <laughs> Again, I think it really depends. Like, you know, if they're like a working session and it's, you know, a, sort of a small sort of intimate group here and it's more, hey, everyone introduce yourself and, you know, tell us who you are, what you're doing, why you're here. That can be a, a great icebreaker for sort of the, that, that type of uh, environment, especially when it's sort of that like working session type of type of thing. And especially if it's all a very homogenous group, right? Like, and you're all on the same page. Right? right. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I will consider that, like you said, it depends. So we'll definitely consider that. Um, I know that I didn't see any, any more questions. Um, somebody did send me a direct message and asked, about ums and us. How do you substitute ums and us? Like what are good substitute words for that? Silence is what I would substitute with an um or an uh. Or, yeah. you know, th those words we're kind of usually saying them because we're thinking about something, right? Like we're, we're coming up with an answer like, um, uh, Right, we can just think and then answer. So, and again, those are one of the things too that as you present more and more, you will probably just do less and less because it's part of your growth and part of that understanding. So, you know, one of the things I tell you is if you do it, don't freak out because everyone's heard it, everyone's done it. You aren't the first, you won't be the last but really trying to think about it. And when we talked way in the early in the presentation about 
you know, getting feedback and those sorts of things. That's a great bit of feedback to ask someone that I um and uh a lot. If I did, when? Was it when I was working through a slide or was it when someone asked me a question and I was trying to address it, so. Yeah, that's that's really good. I have a problem saying like a lot. I'm trying to stop. I really am. It's really bad. <laughs> but yes, that is good silence. So just address that situation with silence before it's, it's kind of like breaking a bad habit um, because I just did it. Once you do it, you know, you're stuck and it's now like a habit. You're doing it forever. So I I am just trying to just stop it all together and just stop saying it. So yeah, just practice doing it if you do it then just try to just stop yourself or I don't know keep doing your run throughs to the point that you you can just go through it and I think it's like you said usually when we say um and uh we're thinking through things um so usually when you do a dry run you know you should be pretty good you know what you're gonna say you don't have to kind of think on the spot so I completely agree this is a lot of great like this is helping you all, but this is helping me as well. <laughs> uh, we are all, you know, learning and trying to better ourselves as presenters. I did a presentation today, and I know that there were some things that I could work on, and he went over a lot of that uh, today in today's session. So I am happy, <laughs> and I, I did. I learned a lot from your session, Eric. Uh, yeah, so is there any more questions? I know everybody's saying thank you so much. I appreciate the input. Yeah, this is really great stuff. I know that we're closing also in on our hour. Um, but if there are no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen. Is there, I, I don't think it needs anything else to the presentation. No, and, and I would just like to, to thank you, Morgan, for all your work helping pull this together. Um, it was great for me because, like I said, I, I ran through this and I, when pulling it together and working with, you know, Bill and the LD team to help get this straightened out, um, found a lot of things that I didn't work all that well on, like, you know, that um I just dropped. So, you know, it's a constant growth and, and, and development. And these are skills that sometimes we focus so much on the map and building the models and coming up with the answer that sometimes we push these off. And so making sure that we're putting a good focus on these as well is, is always key. And so I, I truly appreciate you know, the opportunity to present and, and you know, to answer some of the questions. I hope everybody caught that I'm hiring. Yeah. We got that one. Great. Great. Um, so you know, ally.com slash career to be able to find. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'll make sure I include that. Um, if you want to, if you all have a link or anything that um, you're sending to candidates, I can drop that in our email that I send out after every session. Um, I'm gonna include you on that email as well, but I can add that there too. And you all, Ally, they're hiring. <laughs> much appreciate it. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Eric. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, I do just wanna do a couple of housekeeping things. So, uh, Yes, we. Uh, I will be sending out emails either tomorrow or Friday uh, with the PowerPoint link. Um, recording will be available tomorrow as well, so you can view it on YouTube. Um, our next session will be May 4th, and we're going to be going over technical skills. So that session is going to be a little bit longer. Um, we're going to be going over R, Excel, all of the technical skills that employers are looking for in a potential candidate. So we're going to be going over that May 4th, uh, same time, same day. So Wednesday, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and remember that we still have all these different opportunities that we're bringing to you. So Ally is hiring. There are resume reviewers that are available to you so they can help you review your app your resume, and we also have mock interviews as well, so that that can help you prepare for any internship or job that you're looking to, you know, apply for or interview for. So we have a lot of resources for you all, um, and if you all have any questions, please reach out to me. I 
I'm going to be sending out the email. So if you just have any questions, you can respond back to that email or you all kind of have my my contact information. I've been emailing you for like the past two months now. <laughs> so yeah, so I just want to thank you again, everyone for coming out. Um, yeah, and further information will be sent out this week. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. I hope that you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. Stay safe. Eric, prepare for that rain tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, yes, everybody have a good day. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you.